Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1167 of the Juicebox Podcast. Today I'll be speaking with Owen. He's 26 years old. He's had type 1 diabetes for eight years. His background is in biomedical engineering, and he'd love to work for Dexcom or Insulate. Owen's symptoms of type 1 diabetes reared their head initially at a Cubs game. Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan. If you have type 1 diabetes or are the caregiver of someone with type 1 and a U.S. resident, please go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box and fill out the survey. The survey will take you just 10 minutes. That's how long it took me. The questions are very easy. You'll know the answers to them. And when you do this, you will be helping with type 1 diabetes research. t1dexchange.org slash juice box right there from your sofa. You can help. When you place your first order, for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash juice box. If you're looking for community around type 1 diabetes, check out the Juice Box Podcast private Facebook group, Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter. This is the meter that my daughter has on her person right now. It is incredibly accurate and waiting for you at contournext.com slash juicebox. This episode of the Juicebox podcast is sponsored by CozyEarth.com. Cozy Earth is where I get my clothing, linens, and towels from. They are incredibly comfortable and temperate. I love them. Uh, I really do love them. And I love that I can give you an offer code that will save you 40% off of your entire order. Just use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout and you will save 40% at CozyEarth.com. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at GvokeGlucagon.com forward slash JUICEBOX. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Owen. Uh, I've been a type 1 for about eight years now. And I live in Chicago, lived in the Midwest my whole life. I grew up in the suburbs. So my background is in biomedical engineering. I graduated probably like four years ago or so. And I've been working in research ever since. And I've been wanting to get into like, you know, it would be it would be a dream to work at like Insulet or Dexcom. And I definitely applied for like at least 10 jobs each at those companies. And I didn't get any of them. <laughs> um, Owen, but, Owen how, how old are you? Oh, I'm 26. 26. Okay. And you were diagnosed, would you say eight years ago? Yeah, it was like 2014. You're about, you're about 18 years old. Were you still in high school or out? So yeah, I was still in high school. I was actually 17 okay. when I got diagnosed. Um, I called it like late onset juvenile. <laughs> Those are words most of them don't use anymore. Uh, <laughs> juvenile in general is one. I haven't heard that in a while, uh, but eight years ago. Okay. So let's let's ask a couple questions first. So uh, is there any other type one in your family? No. So my um, maternal grandfather had like type two and he had like hypothyroidism and then eventually um, Parkinson's, but no one else in either side of my family has type one. Okay. But he did have a couple of autoimmune things. He had yeah. thyroid and probably Parkinson's. I think we could call autoimmune too. Um, at yeah. least inflammation based. And that's mm-hmm. your grandfather on your whose side? Mom's side. On your mom's side. Okay. No one else has hypothyroidism or celiac or anything like that? No. No. Okay. Not that I know of, at least for like celiac. I don't I don't think any of my aunts do. I guess one of my cousins does have some like autoimmune stuff, but I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's autoimmune. Okay. So. Yeah. I mean, a little bit, not a lot, but still it's interesting. So when you're diagnosed, what do you remember about that time? Well, so um, it was in the summer and my mom is a, she's like been a nurse her whole life and kind of does more like admin stuff at hospitals now, but 
I was going to a Cubs game with my cousin and she's a nurse practitioner and driving down Addison, like from the highway all the way to the field, I probably had to go to the bathroom like two or three times sitting in traffic. Of course, it was probably like an hour almost. And she was like, this is not normal. And like, I've been complaining to my mom for like weeks and like asking her for like, I need like a insulated, like I need a hydro flask, a really big one. So I can just like fill it up with a ton of water. And so at first when I started showing symptoms, my mom like jokingly was like, you're probably diabetic. And I was like, haha, okay. But so then that like festered in my head for like probably two or three weeks. And then I went to the Cubs game and my cousin was like, well, I'm going to check your blood sugar when we get back. And so she never checked my blood sugar. So I was like, I need to find out. Mm -hmm. And so that morning after I like texted my mom, And I asked if I could like come in and she could just check my blood sugar. And so I went out to breakfast with some friends. And then we went to the, then I went to the, like, went to my mom's work and she checked my blood sugar and it was like 394. Hmm. And so then we like called our, called my pediatrician. And then like she set us up with an endocrinologist. And so then that day we went to, Well, that day we went first to my pediatrician. They took my A1C and it was like unreadable, obviously. And then like the pediatrician passed me on to my first endocrinologist who like got me insulin, um, like meter, you know, like kind of went over the real like short little spiel they give. Yeah. And I was pretty much on my way. I was on... Uh, like MDI and uh, finger pricks for probably like six months. And then I, they put me on a pump and the Dexcom. Mm -hmm. I think it was like the G3 when I first had it. I remember G4. And then there was this weird time where there was seven and seven plus, and that somehow came before four. So I don't, I don't remember a G3, but the numbering system was a little weird in the beginning. So I don't know how to ever mm. figure that out, but they got you on that quickly in six months. Yeah. Was that your doing or did they, um, did your doctor's office push for it? Oh, I definitely wanted it. I like want all of the like best new advanced mm-hmm. stuff. So like they knew that I wanted it, but they're like, you need to know how to do all of this first. And so, I mean, I did. And then like my second visit my a1c was like 10 and then like kept going down by twos pretty much like every time i would go yeah and then like throughout high school my a1c was probably like in the eights because you know like i don't know i was a high schooler and like i didn't pay attention as much probably i would imagine but yeah yeah um and like my parent i had like a lot of independence Like my mom wasn't texting me like, Hey, I see your blood sugar's dropping. Have you like had a snack? So I just, and it's, they knew what to do. I think would they know how to use the PDM? I don't know, but you know, they know like what to look for symptoms. So I mean, so they understand kind of high level, but as far as like actual management, you were you were diagnosed at a time where they probably thought like, he's old enough to know this. And that is that the vibe of how it went. Yeah. Also, I don't think that the first, the first XCOMs didn't share like that. So I don't even think they could have followed you back then. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Um, That's interesting. So let me ask you a question. A couple things. Did MDI Mm -hmm. actually teach you how to take care of diabetes? If you take insulin or so funnel ureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready with Gvoke HypoPen. My daughter carries Gvoke HypoPen everywhere she goes because it's a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly, and they demand quick action. Luckily, Givo Kypopen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Givo Kypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Givo Kypopen 
before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Gvoke Hypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at gvokeglucagon.com slash juicebox. Gvoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. The Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter is the meter that we use here. Arden has one with her at all times. I have one downstairs in the kitchen, just in case I want to check my blood sugar. And Arden has them at school. They're everywhere that she is. Contournext.com slash juice box. Test strips and the meters themselves may be less expensive for you in cash out of your pocket than you're paying currently through your insurance for another meter. You can find out about that and much more at my link. Contournext.com slash juice box. Contour makes a number of fantastic and accurate meters and their second chance test strips are absolutely my favorite part. What does that mean? If you go to get some blood and maybe you touch it and I don't know, stumble with your hand and like slip off and go back, it doesn't impact the quality or accuracy of the test. So you can hit the blood, not get enough, come back, get the rest without impacting the accuracy of the test. That's right, you can touch the blood, come back and get the rest, and you're gonna get an absolutely accurate test. I think that's important because we all stumble and fumble at times. That's not a good reason to have to waste a test strip. And with the Contour Next Gen, you won't have to. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. You're gonna get a great reading without having to be perfect. I don't really know. I think I think once I got, I know I got the Dexcom before the Omnipod. So like, I think, and you know, I feel like I've heard this a dozen times. Like once you can see your, like how your blood sugar reacts to like whatever it is you're doing, like you really get a better idea of like how to control it. And like, yeah, of course. um, So I think MDI wasn't as like, I mean, having to do the calculations, I guess was like good, to like know that, but Mm -hmm. then, I mean, it's obviously so much easier to just type it in. You think that's, that's probably the entirety of it, right? They want you to be able to count carbs and do the math for how much insulin you need. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I don't know that you couldn't figure that out if you were using a pump too, but, uh, but I I guess I get, (laughs) so there was no great learning that came from your MDI time? No. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> Nothing magical happened. You didn't feel like no. you uh, leveled up or anything like that. Well, I definitely felt like I leveled up when I got the pump and the um, or and the Dexcom because mm-hmm. you know you got all this stuff on your body. I think it looks pretty cool. I know some some diabetics are like they'd rather hide it, but I don't know. I think you go for I it. I think it's yeah, I go yeah. for it yeah. because I was a server at a Texas Roadhouse. Um, like when I was in college, like beginning of college and I like was at this table and their kid was like newly diagnosed. And so like super, she was super ashamed, like embarrassed. And like the mom was like, look at, he's just wearing his, his pump right on his arm like that. Like he doesn't care. Like it's okay. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, like this is kind of a acute moment where yeah. I felt like hopefully I could like not help this kid out, but you know, at least he had some example of like someone with diabetes that, you know, didn't let it like hold them back socially. Yeah. Oh, and I don't know. I, I think that that helped you, you know, like just, I, I'm not, I know you're not trying to take credit for it, but it's, um, it's a big deal. Like you did that thing, you wore your device where he could see it and then it, it gives him the confidence maybe to, to not feel so alone or ashamed or however he was feeling. So Mm -hmm. I think it's really nice, actually. You got, and you said you got the pump first or CGM first? CGM first. The Dexcom first. How long were you wearing Dexcom before you went to Omnipod? I think it was like two or three months. It wasn't long. Pretty quickly. Okay. How do you know about these things? Your mom, you do research online. The doctors talk to you about it. Doctors in research, not my mom. (laughs) Yeah. So like the first endocrinologist I had, I really didn't like him. And like, I don't know, I just, it didn't, I didn't feel like he really cared or like was very involved, but I've been seeing 
And there were a couple in between that also were duds, but I've been with the same endo for like four years now. And she's just amazing. I love her. She's out of university of Chicago, um, health system. And, uh, yeah. And she would, she was, she was a big part in like kind of getting me like the five, the Omnipod five. And then like before that she would always like bring up when she would talk about like when it was the Omnipod horizon, Mm -hmm. she brought that up to me. So, I mean, yeah, mostly her and like just my own research. Oh, and what makes a good endocrinologist versus one that you didn't enjoy being with? Um, My current one I don't know. She's just like very sweet and like, like mother, like, I don't know how to describe it, like nurturing. Mm -hmm. And like when I meet with her, you know, we'll go over the, like the gluco three month printout and like find trouble areas. I mean, it's hard to say. Is it more of a vibe then? Then you just, yeah. Yeah. You just sort of get along with this one in a, in a good way versus some in the past that you haven't. Yeah, it might yeah. not. Even, and I think it, I oh, think it really comes down to that. Okay. Yeah, not even so much maybe about knowledge. It's mm-hmm. maybe more about style and personality and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's that. like knowing that, or like thinking that they care more. Like, I just feel like she cared more than she cares more than like the previous ones, and so I think that's like that's big she gives you a feeling that she's actually invested in you and, and, and it feels like a personal relationship. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Do you feel like she has more knowledge than you about diabetes? Yeah, I definitely think there haven't, there hasn't been like a moment with her where she's like kind of said something that I was like, uh, like that's not really how it goes. Mm -hmm. And like, like if you were actually diabetic, like I think she really understands what it's like. Excellent. No, it's really great. And is that dumb luck? You just kind of fell into this one? Yeah, yeah, it was. Well, I was really looking around at this point because I was seeing one in the suburbs. I was living in the city and I have to like go to the suburbs. And so I was like, okay, I need to find one in the city. Mm-hmm. And so I took my time finding her and yeah, I actually have an appointment later this month and it's, I had to like cancel my last one. Cause I, had this appointment scheduled before I got a new job. And so it's been like six months since I've seen the endo. So okay. that's, it's great. Tell me again, what you went to college for? Um, biomedical engineering. You're doing research, but what does that like entail? Well, the research I was doing right out of college was at, uh, in a lab at Northwestern. They were like a skeletal and like cardiac muscle tissue lab. And I was doing like a lot of wet lab experiments. So like, you know, taking tissues from a mouse with muscular dystrophy, um, because that's like a musculoskeletal um, disease. Right. And like, you know, we would give some of the mice like a drug that would hopefully rebuild the muscle. And then like another group like wouldn't have that. So, you know, it was like taking the tissues or muscle muscles from them and then like breaking that all down and then like analyzing using assays, like, we saw this much more growth when we gave them this drug. And then like, we didn't see anyone who gave them this. So it was a lot, a lot, a lot of like pipetting wet lab bench stuff. But my current job, it's a medical device company. And so uh, they specialize in like vital sign monitoring and it's using these like non-invasive sensors. Mm-hmm. And I can show you and turn my camera. Oh, hold on. There. So, it's just like a small, so this is the adhesive right here. Right. And there's like two electrodes on the back part of it. So it can measure ECG, heart rate, respiratory rate. There's a temperature sensor in there. So it can measure core body temperature um, and like an accelerometer. So it can measure like step count. Soon it will be able to like detect falls. So there's a lot that it can do. Um, Where does that go in your body? On your chest? Yeah. So like right in the, in the center, right? Like, underneath your like where your collarbones okay the podcast is sponsored today by the place where i get my oh gosh my sheets my towels some of my clothing a lot of the things that i stay warm or comfortable with cozy earth 
Com. I'm wearing a pair of Cozy Earth joggers right now. I've recently gotten another pair in a different color. I sleep on Cozy Earth sheets. They are so comfortable and soft and temperate. Temperate meaning I'm never hot or cold, which is really saying something because my wife loves to turn that giant fan on, but they keep me nice and warm without making me like sweaty or moist. You know what I mean? You don't want to be moist while you're sleeping. And then, of course, the waffle towels I use every day to dry off my bits and parts after I've showered. CozyEarth.com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout to save 40% off of your entire order. I'm not saying 40% off of one item. I'm saying 40% off of everything you put in the cart. CozyEarth.com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. And so like I'm the the clinical researcher. So like if if they like want to change something on the sensor, it all has to be like validated to make sure that you know these changes are actually going to benefit the sensor. So like I have to like conduct the studies and like compile the data give the data to whoever but i've like always been into technology like my whole life i remember as a kid like as probably like an eight-year-old asking santa for like a computer and my parents were like okay you're crazy it's kind of a good mix of like hands-on sort of like research and then like working with this technology and like there's also like a big part of the sensor is the adhesive so Mm -hmm. You know, I've definitely been handling adhesives for a while now. So I think that's kind of why they hired me was the, the kind of exposure I've had to this kind of stuff. Do you like the work? I do. I really, really like it. I don't know. The sensors are just so cool. They have their own app. So like right now they're FDA approved for clinical research use. And so we're working towards like hospital, like low acuity monitoring. Mm-hmm. So like... For, so, for example, like not the ICU, but like if, you know, someone's in like outpatient, like recovering for like, you know, three hours or so, um, it's kind of that application. But there's also, so that there's the chest sensor, then there's a limb sensor. So it's like a wireless pulse oximeter. Right. And so they all connect to each other and will display on an app. The app that is displaying all the data is designed to look like a bedside monitor, like panel mm-hmm. um like giving all of the like information in like clear easy to read way and so then we also have like a small one a super small sensor <laughs> that's strictly motion oh that is small. and so yeah what is that like maybe an inch inch and a half long yeah 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 it's probably like an inch long oh but so there's like a lot of applications for this the accelerometer in it is so high frequency and sensitive that it can detect like heart rate, like the pulse, like from your skin beating like onto it. So like this is used for like scratch detecting scratch events. So like when you put it on your hand like this and then he's it there, there's an algorithm to detect like when you're scratching, because we've had clients that, want to look into like eczema like people with severe eczema Mm -hmm. they're like how much they scratch themselves at night because some some people will like scratch themselves raw in their sleep yes in their sleep wow and so like um they just want to see like how many scratching events like they have a night and then like another part of it was like there's a like a haptic like feedback in Mm -hmm. here and so like when it would detect the scratching it would vibrate hoping to discourage it wow but that's insane and these are more clinical use spaces like they're not for personal use yet yeah they're not for personal use yet you can also diagnose sleep apnea with it and i know that is like potentially that's something you could get like a prescription for like a prescription for our kit Mm -hmm. and like get it, take it home, wear the sensor and like wear the finger clip, no cords, no wires. And then you just start, you just, you know, start collection, go to sleep. You don't have to like go in for a sleep study where all the like equipment. Yeah. That's crazy. So Owen, um, on your intake, you didn't put much, but you, but you put was interesting. It says, uh, you know, that you were diagnosed uh, at the age you were diagnosed, but then it just says, Recreational drugs. 
<laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't really say anything. What did you want to talk Is about? That what there? I said? You said, what, what are some of the themes you hope to cover? Juvenile diabetes, recreational drugs, independent management, mm-hmm. and I've never been hospitalized. That's what you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what made you want to come on the show? You know what, Scott? I'm, if I'm going to be completely honest, I just thought it was so annoying how involved you are in Arden's diabetes care. Okay. Well, we should talk about that then. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what I want to talk about. Cool. I mean, it's just because I feel like I've had the complete opposite like experience. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think I've been fine. Like I haven't had any episodes. I haven't like passed out. I haven't had to be hospitalized. Right. And so I don't know. And like nowadays my A1C is like, my last A1C was like 6.1. Cool. That's so great. I don't know. I mean, and I feel like when you don't give people that independence, like how are they going to know what to do when something comes up? Like that they don't know what, how to deal with. Do you feel like Arden doesn't have independence? I mean, no, she has independence. I just think there's like oversight that like she has. Hmm. Like, you know, you're, you, I forget what episode this was, but like you were texting her, like, like what I said before, like, Hey, your looks like your blood sugar is dropping. Are you going to like correct for it? Right. I don't know. Like, I think that's too involved. Like you should, like, she should like just be monitoring that herself. Like, I don't understand. I don't know. As an 18 year old, I don't like, it just seems completely different to me. No, but, I mean, I mean, it's fantastic that you're like that. And it's, I'm not saying this is a bad thing at all. I just think it's different. <laughs> different than what you had? Yes. Is there any part of you that wishes that someone w- was helping you? E- I mean, yes, but I don't think I would want as much like micromanaging. So so I think that's where it's possible that it's um, lost in translation a little bit because you hear mm-hmm. a thing in an episode of a podcast and it probably... You can leave that feeling like that's the entirety of my world. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, I have, I'm following Arden on Dexcom, for example, and my alarm is set between 70 and 120. So let me go back. I'm going to go back 12 hours. And you tell me how many times you think my phone is alarmed. Three. Once. And it was while she was in the shower. So her blood sugar always goes up in the shower lately. So it's not even a thing I paid attention to. So she was getting ready to leave to go to college uh, to drive home, by home, back to school. She got a 700 mile drive to go back to school. She's actually about, I don't know now, uh, four or five. She's probably, she's probably around Virginia now. So maybe she's gone maybe 300 miles or something like that. Hmm. And I haven't, I haven't looked at my, I am picked the phone up to talk to you about it, but I haven't looked at this Dexcom app since, let me see the last time it got my attention. It got my attention at one o'clock in the morning mm. when she dipped down low for a minute. And other than that, this is the first time I'm looking at it. So it's 3.30 in the afternoon now. So I haven't looked at this in 14 hours. Okay. All right. Oh. And so, but if she's off at college or somewhere else and I get a low alarm and I mean, that's going to be 70. I take a look at it. If it's just 70, I wouldn't think anything of it. I mean, honestly, I think if it went to 65, I wouldn't think much about it, but if she looked like it was still falling and it looked dangerous, dangerous isn't even the right word. If it looked emergent, like it wasn't going to stop falling, then I might send her a text and say, Hey, are you okay? But other than that, I mean, I don't know. It's a thing you could have heard a year ago or two years ago, and it's hard to know exactly. I would tell you that I am as disconnected from diabetes management between her and I as you, as anyone probably could imagine. Mm-hmm. But when I'm on here, I'm talking about it. So that's, I don't know if it doesn't. Yeah, I guess that kind of. Get excuse it a little bit. Like, yeah. like, like, like if you, um, I don't know. Let's think of someone else who's podcast. Do you listen to any other podcasts? 
No, sir. No. Just yours. Okay. About diabetes, at least. Yeah. Well, even other ones, like, you know, if you listen to one from a comedian or something like that, you know, they have plenty of times they're not joking around. You just don't hear it because that's not what they do on their podcast. I, that's my mm-hmm. assumption because I don't feel, I mean, forget how I feel. I don't look in on her diabetes that frequently. I mean, my, my extent of my contact with her diabetes in the last four days even is... I think she sent me a text once and said, hey, could you throw a juice in here? Because she was on a call with somebody and she couldn't get off the call. And uh, she asked me to fill her pump this morning while she was running around, like putting stuff in her car. She's like, can you fill that pot? I have to put a pot on before I go. And I think that's pretty much it. But anyway, uh, I take your point, though. And I also this is not the first time somebody's brought it up to me. And listen, I don't know, right, because this is me assuming people from, you know, just talking to them. But I've either heard people who had a hard time when they were kids and no one helped them and they almost feel like I wish someone would have helped me. Or there are those people who are a little older and they've really persevered through something and believe that that perseverance has taught them something and then think if other people aren't thrown into that fire, they don't get to have the outcome. I just think there are a lot of different ways to get to the outcome. Is my, I guess yeah. that would be my, my opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, definitely. But that's fun. You just wanted to come on here to say that to me. <laughs> I mean, no, that wasn't the only thing. <laughs> I know you have talked about recreational <laughs> drugs. <laughs> I know. I don't know exactly what recreational drugs I meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know which ones you meant, or now that you're being recorded, you don't know which ones you want to admit to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'm going to answer that. <laughs> no, no, probably just like. Like occasional marijuana use. I have like noticed that whenever, if my blood sugar is like normal or let's say it's like slightly falling, um, but like not falling to where I'm like worried about it Mm -hmm. after I'll smoke, it will like drop. And so like, if it was falling, it's going to just fall even more. And I just think in terms of like, I think it has to do like insulin sensitivity, like, you when think you, you become that. so you think you become more sensitive is there any chance that you have a low lying level of stress or anxiety most of the time that gets taken away and then you're not being your blood sugar's not being pushed up by adrenaline and anxiety that kind of thing okay well now that you say that <laughs> i have never thought about that but that very well could also be <laughs> does your blood sugar fall something that sh- goes into it does it fall in the shower no do you find showers very relaxing Mm-hmm. Or do you think in the shower? Oh yeah, yeah. So maybe that's not a relaxing think place. In the for you. shower. <laughs> so if you're say, so, my thought would be, I don't know how weed would make you more insulin sensitive, but I can see how if you were, and I'm, and this isn't top of my mind right now, by the way, because it's back to school right now while we're recording this, and the mm-hmm. um, number of posts uh, that I'm seeing on the Facebook group from people whose children are going back to school and they're like, oh, the kid's blood sugar is going up in the morning. And as soon as like, that makes sense to me because they're either super excited to go to school or super anxious about school or don't want to be there, but they're probably having some sort of a visceral reaction that's pushing their blood sugar up. And then a lot of people will see that pass after the first couple weeks of school when they kind of settle in. And then some people don't. Like I can tell you that there was an amount of insulin when Arden was in high school there was an amount of insulin she needed throughout the day in school to keep her blood sugar down where it was. But almost exact 15 minutes, 20 minutes after school was over and whatever pressure came from school, once that was gone, she had to eat something because all of that insulin that we needed throughout the day to hold down that, you know, adrenaline, stress, anxiety spike, um, it suddenly was still left there, but her stress and anxiety lessened. And boom, her blood sugar would fall. So you had about Mm -hmm. 20 minutes after school was over for her to eat something every every day. And then it was fine throughout the rest of the night. It's just, and she didn't need as much basil when she wasn't in school. It's interesting, actually. Yeah, it's it's that uh, cortisone that's gonna. The cortisol, yeah. Yeah, 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 cortisol. Yeah, yeah, it hits you. I was like, cortisone. What's he got? Yeah, He's no, got the good word. stuff over there. Are you are you injecting yeah. cortisone? <laughs> That'll push your blood sugar up, by the way. Cortisone, Jesus. Oh yeah, knee steroid. Have you ever had one of those shots? No. 
Arden just got one last month in her shoulder. Mm -hmm. She's some inflammation in her shoulder and they gave her a cortisone shot. And man, I'm not kidding you. Like it did not take an hour for her blood sugar to start going up. And really? yeah, yeah. And then it needed, I want to say like 30% more insulin, maybe more for like two and a half days, almost three Jeez. days. It was really something. And then you could watch it tail off and, and, uh, it was kind of back to normal just from that one quick injection. It was, it was kind of crazy actually. Yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. Do you know anybody else who has diabetes? Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple. Well, I have one friend, I guess, one diabetes. Uh, we live right by each other. Um, we've been friends since like high school. But um, well, like when I was diagnosed, we weren't like she was a year older than me. So like she was out of school. And I like didn't really know she was until like later in life now that we like live by each other. So, you know, we like share you know, supplies whenever like one of us needs it. Um, and it's weird. Like every time we hang out, our blood sugars will be like the same and we'll like compare. So she's like a nutritionist and I'll like calibrate with her. I'll be like, okay, wait, so this would, so what would you give for like this, like this, like this meal? And she would, and what I'm trying to say is that we would both be, what I'm trying to say is that my carb counting is good because Miss Nutritionist is always like right where I'm guessing it at. Um, so like, it's nice to have like a friend like that where you can kind of like really dive in to yeah. like each other's data. Right. Yeah. And just check time. against each other. Like, what do you, how many carbs do you think this is? Or, mm -hmm. do, do, or do you like, bolus for the fatness or not or do you get involved in that like bolusing for fat and protein in your food yeah so like if i'm gonna be eating like a high fat meal like pasta pizza i'm gonna well since the five doesn't have extend bolus mm -hmm. i'll just like give an additional like bolus after after like some of the meal time insulin that i took kind of like went away yeah you almost um, pre-bolus the fat rise that's coming yeah what's that yeah. About like an hour into the meal, yeah, I would I would honestly say like maybe a little bit more than an hour. Either okay, is when I'll see it because like I would I usually do expect it like around an hour after the meal, but I'm always waiting for it. More like not could be like I mean I I usually see it with people like hour ninety minutes like in that space somewhere, but you still have to get mm -hmm. the insulin in in time to catch it, or then you're yeah. ch then you're chasing it and it's high and you can't get it back anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, and where did you learn to do all that? Is that just trial and error from having diabetes for this long? Yeah. It's excellent. I mean, I, yeah, I haven't had any, I had a diabetes educator when I like was first diagnosed, but then like, for some reason, insurance doesn't cover that question mark. Like when I at least went probably like six years ago, seven years ago at this point, I remember we had to like pay for it and it was expensive hmm. so it was like well i'm just gonna like do this on my own but you know it's been fine no it sounds like it's going really well actually i mean six ones wonderful. yeah no yeah no i'm like like i just feel so that i knew a couple other diabetics in high school and i weren't really friends with them and i just feel like i have a completely different diabetic life than they do like i just feel like i'm way more in control and like not I don't know, bouncing everywhere. I, have, I don't have any other like complications. And so I know like, I know that's like not everyone's case. Right. And I'm definitely lucky to have a lax diabetes experience so far. Knock on wood. <laughs> definitely knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think that's just because you took it so seriously when you were younger? Yeah, definitely. I mean, my mom, she always says like, if one of my kids were to get diabetes, like it's best for Owen <laughs> because she thinks I'm like the most responsible and like proactive child. I have, I'm like the oldest of four. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, yeah, she's kind of right. I mean, might be right. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I feel like I just care for it more. You said early in the beginning, you didn't as much. So was there a moment that kind of drew you towards doing better or an age, something in your life? Yeah, I think like halfway through college, I 
definitely like kind of noticed uh, that I just wasn't feeling like as great all the time. I was a little groggy. I was always stressed. So like I could literally, I would literally make my blood sugar like rise. If, if I like saw it going down, I would, I don't know. I would try to stress myself out and I swear I would like be able to bring my blood sugar up. And this was like pre Omnipod five. Yeah. Just by like stressing. Well, I I have to tell you when Arden was first diagnosed and she was a little, little kid, like three, I think this story is from when she was maybe three or four years old. And that's going back like 13, 14 years ago. I realized that if she was getting low and I couldn't get her to drink something that I could actually pick a fight with her and like piss her off a little bit, like almost get into a little argument and it would catch the low and bring it back. So I think you're talking mm. about the same thing. I, I actually, I think you're saying the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah we, that was, uh, it happened the first time by mistake. Oh, and it was just like, you know, this like begging drink, this please that turned into <laughs> like, yelling that turned into her yelling mm-hmm. back and being upset and then i was like oh my god it stopped the the low and then there was a handful <laughs> there was a handful of times that if we couldn't get her to eat we would just engage her like that and try to just get her riled up a little bit and it would stop it i mean we didn't do it much longer after she was older and she could understand a little better but it it mm-hmm. saved us once or twice i'm not gonna lie that's really I believe it. interesting you said that yeah i mean what is it i mean you're 26 right so I don't know how dating is. I'm I'm pretty old, so I don't know how it goes anymore. But but do you um when you're dating or if you are, do you share this with people? If so, how soon into a relationship? Like what's your level of expectation from them about diabetes? Yeah. I'm like not a I would rather like they know and I like don't care talking about it, explaining it to them. But in my experience, like it's been fine. People kind of find it, people that I've at least gone out with have found it kind of cool, I guess. Like, Mm -hmm. not cool, but like... Interesting, at least. Yeah, interesting. You know, I have all this stuff for it. Do you go go into any of the... I mean, I guess it depends on how long you're around somebody, right? But... Like if you're just, if you're just on a first date, you're not going to tell somebody like, Hey, I might pass out here. If my blood sugar gets low, that's not going to happen. But like, you don't give them that kind of heads up. I imagine. No, I wouldn't give them that. I mean, like if it came up or something, or if they like saw me, they like saw a sensor on me. Like I, I wouldn't bring it up like just naturally. Mm -hmm. If, if it was like part of the conversation somehow, like maybe I would, I mean, I have, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wrong to say that like upon first date it's just i wouldn't and it's like situational i i I would say 100 percent. have you been in a longer relationship Mm -hmm. do you start to tell them more or do they start to ask more what do you what do you find well they they definitely notice more i would say as like time goes by because you know like you can try to teach like them how to like use the pdm or like refill a pod I mean, you can't really, like, you can tell them all this stuff, but until they, like, see it and observe it for themselves, like, they're really not going to understand. So, in my experience, I think it's just taking time for them to, like, learn more and notice more. As with, like, my friends, of course, too, like, they definitely can tell, like, when I'm low, Mm -hmm. at least that's an easy one. Yeah, I actually dated this diabetic for a little bit. And it was a little crazy, but just another example of someone who had a definite, like, harder diabetic life than, like, than I, and, like, struggled a little bit, so I kind of felt bad, but... Did that lead you to try to help them, and were they not interested? Did they not see it as different or in need of help? I think, yeah, I mean, I would, of course, like, help out in any way I could, I think there was like insurance issues like happening with them and sure. like, like po- possibly like other mental health stuff that definitely doesn't like, definitely doesn't help you out I with see. diabetes. But, um, is that incredibly awkward? I mean, when you start seeing it, you think, oh, they're whatever they're doing or not doing. And, and you think, oh, I, I wish they knew or like, do you feel like it's okay to say something or did that not occur to you to do? Did you just kind of keep quiet about it or did you talk to them? 
I don't know. I would talk to him. I mean, yeah. I mean, it really depends on what it is. If it's like something kind of like serious, like I probably wouldn't really be as like forward, like as to like suggesting something, but like little things and like little habits like that, you know, they could be talking about that. I like find wrong or like Mm -hmm. they could be doing something differently. Like definitely I would like, give a little suggestion, but I mean, I definitely voice my opinion in like a hopefully respectful way. Yeah. I imagine you would have. Do you think it was uncomfortable for them to see you doing uh, better? Possibly. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that thought went through their mind, honestly. Cause like, I don't, we like, there wasn't a point where we like really compared like our diet, like, I don't know, like our, intimate like data sort of like yeah. so it kind of it kind of stayed more like on the surface but you notice you're pre bolusing and they're not or something like that and like mm-hmm. that you get you see a spike and they don't do anything that kind of thing yeah yeah that's up i mean was it upsetting to you did it impact i mean you said there were other issues but did it impact the relationship or were you able to let them do their thing and it not bother how you felt about them well, I feel like it did kind of impact our relationship. I don't know. She was like moving, so it kind of, there were like other things that went into it. Mm-hmm. So I met her on the hinge, and one of her like prompts was it was like the insulin pump stays on during sex, or it was the insulin pump like comes off during sex or something. And so of course I like commented on that. And I was like, oh, well, not for me. I have an Omnipod. And then it kind of just started from there. Yeah. That's good. Hey, listen, you got to find a flirtation somehow. That's not, that's as good as any. <laughs> that's I know. Yeah. I'm going to use whatever I can get. <laughs> oh, it's like, this ain't an easy game. <laughs> well, it's not. <laughs> well, it's got to be even more difficult now, right? Because people work from home so much. Like, do you work out of your home ever? Not often, but like I can. Yeah. It's tough to meet people if everybody's working from home or not going out after work. You know, it's to mm-hmm. where do you meet people as you get to be older? You know, it's tough. I know, yeah, it is because I'm not someone to just go to a bar and like have a drink. Mm-hmm. Um, like I don't have a neighborhood bar that I go to. So, I mean, I guess not that I would want to meet someone at a bar. I mean, whatever. I don't really care. I guess, but. I don't know. It is hard to meet people like as an adult, even in like a city, but it's like, I feel like you just have to like go out. You have to like do things. You have to like join clubs, sports, rec sports leagues. Yeah. Like it's a lot. It really is. Yeah, It I, is a lot. <laughs> I, I was graduating from high school and my, I remember an older cousin telling me he just left the last place. It's easy to meet girls. That's what he told me when I left. And I was like, what? And then I thought, oh, man, he's right. <laughs> yeah. It's tough. it's tough, man. It's just the meeting people is. part is tough. Forget the like romantic side of it is, you know, another yeah. level. But it's it's hard to me, especially when you work all day and you're tired and it's not like you're mm-hmm. like you're full of like vim and vigor at like six o'clock, right? You're hungry and you gotta get home and you gotta mm-hmm. get up again in the morning. It's uh it's a grind. I think that's why they call it a grind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really i really love the grind yeah i'm sure you do um <laughs> <laughs> so tell me something about the jobs you applied for with some of the diabetes companies do you think you were just too young you didn't have enough experience or wh- why do you think they weren't uh they didn't come back to you yeah i think i didn't have enough experience at the time and they want like more than a bachelor's degree mm-hmm. so i mean i kind of realized that a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering like really gets you nothing and like biomedical engineering as a major is like stupid because you so in bme you you i took like chemical engineering classes mechanical engineering classes electrical engineering computer engineering did i say chemical engineering Mm -hmm. chemical engineering it's so like you're taking all of these classes in the different disciplines of engineering and you're taking like the first course first or second course so it's like your your what is the phrase um like 
knower or like it's like master of none oh uh, knower. uh hold on a second uh, uh jack of all trades master of none yeah that's the one yeah, right that's exactly okay. what it is okay and it kind of leaves you like with little knowledge in like all of these different fields and like of course there was like the core biomedical engineering which was like physiology like measuring things happening in the body like flow rates through like the kidneys or like the amount of force like the heart is like pumping out or, or like the pressure like going against like all of your like blood vessels so it was like quantitative it was very quantitative physiology is how i would describe it mm -hmm. yeah don't don't do biomedical engineering kids do something else oh and here's the thing i've never once spoken to a college graduate who has said to me i loved my major it was the greatest thing to do everyone always goes oh what a waste of time i shouldn't have done that i'm not ready to do anything blah blah, blah. it's uh that's the that that really i mean my son's younger than you he's 23 uh he's only been out of college for like a year or so but um i mean he's like right now at a job where he's like, I got to move on. He goes, I've gotten everything I can get out of this already. And you know, he's like, so I got to take this experience that I have and build and take it somewhere else and build on it again. He's like, if I stay here, this is the thing I'll do for the rest of my life, y mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and he's like, and there's not that much room for advancement here, et cetera. And so he's already thinking that direction. It sounds like you are as well. I think the truth is, well, I don't know about nowadays, but in the past, College was supposed to be a measure of your ability to learn. Like, can I throw something new at Owen and they and he gets it and then he can apply it later? They they used to pick uh, a lot of different majors that way. Like, a, this is a difficult thing that we really don't need this person to know that much about, but it does prove they can read a lot of information, retain it, and stick it back out again, right? So, um, so then you got to know that about yourself, and you know, trust me, you know. Be, where you're really going to learn is at work in, in my opinion. Yeah. In oh, no. jobs. 100%. Like yeah. there were things in the lab, the last lab that I worked in that I was like, learn, actually learning how to do in that lab that I remember learning about in school, but it was like, we read about it. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually do it. And like, it's completely different to read about something and how it's done rather than like doing it. Yeah. It, it leaves you feeling very, um, unsure when you when you're moving mm -hmm. into the world right because yeah yes i took this class i i think i understood it i got a good grade etc but i i don't know what you do with this thing like i don't like i have this thing now i don't know what the world wants from me uh in regards to it and that's i mean that was a hard that was a leap for my son i was like you know you gotta just take that job and go in there and, and have a little confidence you gotta, you gotta you know? fake it till you make it yeah. too you know <laughs> yeah Listen, part of it. learn and repeat and then see if you can learn some more and meet people. And it's a whole, you know, it, it's a almost like it's a little politicking and it's a little bit of, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a lot of a lot of a little things. Dude, I don't yeah. know. I think that it's another one of those um kind of falsehoods that we we tell each other, like, well, you'll go to college and when you come out, you'll be a thing. And mm -hmm. that's true for some people. Like some people go to nursing school and they come out and they're a nurse. And, you know, but that's almost more, uh, I've got the wrong phrase in my head. I don't mean blue collar. I mean like a functional job. Like you learn to do a thing mm -hmm. and then you go do that. Like you physically accomplish mm -hmm. that thing. When you're in a business like the one you're in or the one my kid's looking at or something like that, there's a thousand things happening. They're just looking for someone to understand some of it and get it done. You, you know, like mm -hmm. it's uh, it's really is interesting. It's not what you expect when you go into college. That's that's for certain. No, it's really not. Like I was not prepared to go out into the workforce from college. No, it's all a scam. It truly <laughs> is. Like if I were to do it over, I would go to like a trade school, join a union, and I'd be making like over a hundred k at this point. Do you think there's a thing out there that you would enjoy doing that doesn't involve your degree? Yeah, nothing like technical, I would say. Like, I love photography and like videography. I love like film and TV. So, like, honestly, if I were to like do something else, it would be in that. But, okay. I really do like this field I'm in. I wanted to be in like the medical 
medical industry, medical device industry. And like the company that I'm at, they're, I guess you could say they're a startup, Mm -hmm. but they're in like, in no way struggling for money. Okay. So there's like, there's a lot of upward growth for me here too. And so like, that's really what I'm I'm happy about. Cause my last job, it was like stagnant, never worked. Academia, academia sucks, mm-hmm. Scott. <laughs> I like, think I've heard that before. It's such a toxic environment, and like, it's like a dick measuring contest. <laughs> but, but about how smart you are. Yeah, or like you know, how many papers have you published? published? Mm-hmm. Or like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I I think the key. I mean, honestly, like it's obvious, right? The key is to do something that you enjoy um that is fulfilling somehow and mm-hmm. i mean that, that's not an easy thing to do I'll, I'll tell you that i i count myself as incredibly lucky that I, I that i do a thing that i enjoy that i i appear to be good at and that that it pays bills like mm-hmm. i mean and it helps people like who like that's a i mean i don't usually talk like this but that's a blessing like how many times do you get to do something where you help somebody you, you know and um yeah I mean, it doesn't get better than that. No, really. it's very, and it's very random that it works out. Like, it, like if, if you sat me down and said, you have to tell me how you did this. I don't know. I don't know if I could explain it to you. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, and yeah. I think that's the same for everybody. I think everybody ends up where they end up partially because they, they moved themselves in that direction and just, just wouldn't stop. And partially because the tide takes you where it takes you. You know, it's a little mix, mm-hmm. I think. But I yeah, I have, dude, I have no idea. I have no answers. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really don't have any either. It just it's time and effort, really. Yeah, you got to just you, you. You, I mean, when people are successful, they often say things like, "I just like you know." I don't think you manifest anything. I, I think it's kind of bull when people say that. <laughs> But there's part of it that's true is that you got to get up every day with a singular focus and do a thing and, you know, pick up the hammer and swing it hard. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's no doubt. I made this podcast for a long time and I didn't make, you know, anything and hardly anybody was listening to it. it it's, you know, it, it's, I mean, honestly, man, like I've said this a couple times on here, but the first year I made the podcast, like 365 days, that podcast had as many downloads in that first 365 days as it had yesterday. Oh my God. I am not kidding. All right. I believe it. That that's a hard boy. They ended that first year. You're like, what did I just spend 12 months of my life (laughs) on? Like, yeah, people like it. And they're telling me that they're like, you know, they enjoy it and everything. I'm like, but if this doesn't grow, like, I mean, I don't know what to do. Like I get, it's a lot of time, you know, next year it doubled and, doubled again and then i was like oh maybe it's just gonna keep doubling and you know like and then it and it, it kept growing and growing and i was like all right right on mm-hmm. you know like and and to me that's an indication that people are hearing it and vibing with it enough to share it with somebody else mm-hmm. uh, so and that there dude you think it's hard to go to a job and and get help i have zero feedback i make <laughs> i make all of my decisions based on numbers that click by me every day and that's that's the only thing I can use to guide myself. I mean, you've made it this far, so you've done something right. I ain't giving up now, man. I think I got I got no. a hand, I got a handle on it now. But but yeah. it's um but it's just like at any time along there, I guess my bigger point was if I would have quit in the first four years, I don't know that anybody could have blamed me. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's yeah. a lot of work and was very little return as far as Listen, if if you could put a pot of gold next to me and I could pick out of it when the when the electric bill came, then I'd sit here and make this podcast all day for free and I'd I'd giggle about it. You know what I mean? Uh, but you got you got to pay a bill at some point, so um, it's hard, man. Like I don't know, and 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 by the same token, when I hear people talking, like my son talking about the jobs he's looking for, or whatever, there's part of me that's like I would not be good at that. I'm not good at thinking about like if you made me a thing. I'd be that thing every day for the rest of my life. That's hard. That's a hard thing for me to swallow. Yeah. You can't mold yourself to what society wants you to be, Scott. (laughs) Oh, and it's a ridiculous thought. I'm 52, but I am a bit of a free spirit when it comes to stuff like this. Like I just, I swear to you, I had a, I don't know how old I was, 
middle school going to high school. And um, on the last day of school, the guidance counselor kind of pulled me into a doorway. And he says, I, I, I've always wanted to tell you, I, I thought you'd make a good attorney. And I looked at him. I mean, I was in ninth grade. How old was I? You know what I mean? And, um, and, and I said, but my only response was, thank you. But then I'd be an attorney every day. And he, I think he looked at me like, uh oh, this one's dumb. And I didn't realize it, you, you know, and like, and, um, and, and he's like, uh, and I kind of walked away from him and wished him a good, like, happy summer or something. But I don't think he knew what I meant. I, what I meant was, I don't think I could do the, forget being an attorney. Like, I don't think I could do the same thing every day for the rest of my life. I, that seems hard. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so now I make a pot. I'm a grown man who has a podcast. Can you imagine my tax return says <laughs> podcaster on it, Owen? It does. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> it's <ridiculous>. interesting. <laughs> the, the the gentleman that does my uh, my taxes it makes me sound fancy. I'm not fancy, oh. uh, but but the the guy that does my taxes, um, he'll tell me every like every couple of years he'll say, uh, I, I I work with another influencer. And I'm like, and I'll always say, like, I, I, I don't think of myself that way. I'm like, but oh, yeah, don't call me that. Yeah, it's a weird word, but okay. Tell me your story, you know. And the other one is always there's a lady who does reviews of kitchen appliances, hmm. and I'm I go I always go that's interesting, and and it sounds like he's never said. I want to be clear, he's never said, but he made it sound like there's a small fortune in that game. And I was like, wait, I don't understand. He goes, like, they'll send her a refrigerator. Then she'll review it. Mm. And I'm like, okay. And then she puts up her videos and makes her money off her videos. And I'm like, right. And she goes, then she sells the refrigerator. I was like, God, she gets a free yeah. refrigerator. Then she sells the free refrigerator. I was like, this is genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, you can't sell anything on this, can you? That, what, what am I going to sell? You, I mean, I need the microphone. I only have a microphone and a computer. I got nothing left. <laughs> and I, oh, I work good. You could make like a master class or something or like consult for, on, well, I guess you don't have on podcast any thing? credentials. I have no credentials. What am I going to do? Yeah, never mind. <laughs> Come talk to Scott. He almost got through high school with no trouble. <laughs> Someone's got to give you an honorary degree from somewhere. Yeah, now we're on to something. Now I like the way you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> Before you were a little judgy about the, the helicoptering thing, but now I like you. I think you're right on. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. That well, might have come off a little. You didn't come off at all. Anything like that. You're not nearly the first person to say it to me. So I was happy to talk about it. Don't think anything about it. But yeah, you're right. I need a. I need an institution. All right, right. So I'm willing to speak at a graduation for an honorary degree. Is that what I'm supposed to say out loud? Right. Yeah. Hopefully, well, someone hears that. that yeah. Can and, make that happen. And then I'll just write doctor in front of my name. I'll do that thing. Like Dr. <laughs> Phil can't really be a, do- now I'm besperching Dr. Phil. Maybe he is a doctor. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> that's all I need. I-, I mean, listen, if I'm being honest with you, I have thought that at the end of this, whenever the end of this comes, that it, it might be an interesting idea to, to put a, like a diabetes masterclass together. And, you know, once the podcast dies, I mean, it's got to go. You know what, man? It's the ninth year. Every year I say this has got to be it. And then every year it gets more downloads. So I don't know. Like, but it's got to stop eventually. And when it does, I thought maybe that would be a nice thing to leave behind. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't know. I don't plan. Dude, I'm not good at planning ahead. So yeah, all, I can t- yeah. <laughs> all I can tell you is, is that uh, this little counter here tells me that in the next day or so, I am going to achieve my 14 millionth download. Oh my God. Yeah. And um, trust me, the first four years weren't helping a lot towards that number. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure that was it's not, minuscule. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this year, mm, best guess, I should do 6 million this year. Wow. Yeah. So it's like population of a big city. Uh, well, it's a. Uh, it's it's enough to help to help people and to let it grow. Like I but mm-hmm. like the numbers aside, like like I can look at people trying to come into the private Facebook group, for example, and they'll tell you where they heard about the podcast or the Facebook group as part of the intake. And you're in that group actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so it's really cool to hear that people are being sent in by their physicians, by their children's hospitals, uh, by each other. 
uh, it's very, very, you know, I was talking to, to a nurse practitioner. I, I interviewed a girl the other day. She said that her, the CDE was just, you know, where she got all of her help from. So the endos in there talking, 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 and not saying anything. And they, and they said, no, the endo walks out of the room and the C, the CD, the, the CD turns to her and, and she just looks her in the eye and she goes, listen to me. Don't forget this juiceboxpodcast.com. And <laughs> I mean, really though, like I, I started listening to this, like after I like had all these habits, if I would have gotten, if I would have heard all of this, like a long time ago, it would have been spectacular because oh, I'm glad to know that. there's just so much that goes into it that your endocrinologist or like CDE, like does it get, and, you know, and it, it helps to really hear people's own experiences with whether they, you know, they have a child with diabetes or like they have diabetes. I don't know. It just, you know, I think knowledge is power. And like the more people, I mean, I guess this is nosy, but like the more I know about like someone's like diabetic life, I have a lot more to go off of. If like yeah. something happens to me and like, you know, like, oh, I heard this from there or whatever. It's information but, you can try to apply to yourself. Mm -hmm. And help yourself with it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's uh, one of the things I was hoping to do when I started the podcast. It's amazing. Actually, geez, after the way, the way, so it's interesting. Oh, and you're, in, you're like an enigma a little bit. Do you know that about yourself? I have been, I have been told that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am reading you correctly then. That's excellent. Um, <laughs> because there's a part of me that like for a little bit, I was like, he's going to yell at me. And then, and then, <laughs> and then, and then. You didn't. I think we had a lovely conversation. And now here we're at the end and you're like, I listened to this podcast. And I was like, God, I part of, part of me thought like you didn't listen to this. <laughs> so it was That's interesting because I do, I do talk to people that have never heard, like I've talked to people who've never heard the podcast. And it, anyway, sometimes those are, are really interesting conversations and mm -hmm. I enjoy them a lot. Uh, but mm -hmm. I thought for sure you were going to be like, like, yeah, I don't, I don't listen to your silly podcast, Scott. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, the last one I listened to was when you were suggesting the like bright bright ideas in Landmines book. Mm -hmm. I forget, I forget who was on it. Like Ian was his name or something. But uh, my gosh, I know his name. Hold on a second. I'm insult. I'm insulting him to not know his name. Or I'm gonna. Look he just it up hasn't first. been on in a while. Oh, the Adam, author. Adam. Yeah, Adam, Adam Brown or something. Brown. Yes. I, I, I'm sorry, Adam, it took me that long to come up with your name. Uh, sorry, Adam. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Um, so you you go back and listen to the older ones, too? Yeah. I mean, I'll just go back and kind of, like, read the descriptions. No offense to parents, but usually when it's, like, a parent, like, the child has diabetes, I don't know. I don't really listen to those as much. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they... Well, Owen, ahead. we can dig into that for a second if you want. You know, I, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm making an assumption, but it sounds like you're pissed that your mom didn't help you with your oh, diabetes. You don't, want to, <laughs> you don't want to hear from ladies who are helping their kids with their diabetes. <laughs> you know what, Scott? You might, you might have just unlocked something in me that <laughs> prior therapists have just not been able to do. <laughs> wow. Well, you can send over, send over your copay. But yeah. um, I... I, I Listen, you would not nearly be the first adult who I've spoken to who got thrown into the fire and didn't come out of it as well as they had hoped, want very much to believe that the fight was worth having, and so they think that the way they did it was the best way, but somewhere not that far under the surface, there's a little kid inside of them that needed help, and they didn't get helped, and it, it hurts, mm -hmm. so... You know, I think that's not an uncommon story. Honestly, I'm not saying that's yours, but it's definitely not an uncommon story. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, you could. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I had you figured out like 45 minutes ago, but I think it's <laughs> insulting to just lay it out with it that early on. <laughs> <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> there's a reason 14 million times this thing's been downloaded. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love you, Owen. This has been terrific. You have, from the beginning, your name is not spelled Owen. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good little PSA. Well, you jumped on and you were like, my name's Owen. And the voice in my head went, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Kudos to you for still pronouncing it as Owen, because most of the time, 
some like if someone hears my name, I'll talk to them. They'll say it fine, but then once they read it, they'll start calling me like Ian or something. Oh, and hell, I'm like, I have it. Ugh. I have it written down in front of me phonetically, like because I was a thousand percent sure I was going to call you Ian. So I just like I wrote it down while I was as soon as I started. Uh, but yeah, no, it was funny. Like there, I swear to you, that little comic voice in my head was like, I don't think he knows his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like what is up with this guy like <laughs> i was like is this some weird club kid thing what am i gonna find out while i'm talking to this guy it's literally i couldn't figure it out <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get into oh it's hilarious is there anything i didn't bring up that i should have because uh, i need to wrap up but i just want to make sure we don't miss anything no i mean honestly i guess i kind of want to show you my tattoo i have like one like is it an engine? What it's is a check that? engine light. I'm really into cars. You see, that's cool. I love cars, and my my dad was like a he was a sheet metal worker, and then he like restored cars, and so now he like restores classic cars. So like, I don't know. I've that's had excellent. a automobile influence my whole life. So you so. put a check engine light on there. Does it work? Does it blink when it's going wrong? <laughs> it's just constantly on. I can't. I can't get it to turn off. Really. I can't get it to turn off. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Wow. And by the way, way to come through in the ninth hour here, or in the 11th hour, excuse me, with the title, Check Engine Light. Check Engine. Oh, I think you we know call what? This I one... was wondering what... Yeah, we call this one Check Engine. Check Engine. Yeah. And then I have this one, too. And Oh, that's cool. Very nice. Mine are all like uh, Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> There's no, no thought into my tattoos whatsoever. I do have a big circuit board on my back actually oh, but that's it's cool old. it's old i don't know i haven't seen it in a long time i couldn't even begin to tell you what it looks like <laughs> i'm not even kidding there's one time it's um it's probably seven by ten oh, and geez. so I, I i'm sure i've told this story so i'll go through it very quickly i used to work in a sheet metal shop mm-hmm. uh, you just i do remember you talking about that yeah. yeah and uh one of the welders i heard him yell and curse and i looked up and usually people get hurt. So you're like, oh, shit, yeah. somebody's hurt. You know what I mean? Like, like so uh, I looked up to see what was going on. And I looked up in time to see his radio flying across the room. So boom boxes back then, like just these square plastic things with two speaker girls in the front had a radio in it, a cassette player. Usually mm-hmm. this thing is. F- and by the way, electronics used to be really expensive. This is like a two hundred dollar item flying sure. across the room back when two hundred dollars was a lot of money. Not like now. When for some reason going to Moe's and getting a bowl costs forty five bucks, but um, like, am I wrong? No, you are not. <laughs> I left the grocery store the other day. I felt like an old lady. I was like, they are shaking us down for this crap. But anyway, Don't so even the get radio. Me started. <laughs> oh my god, the radio's flying across the room. It hits a wall. It explodes. And I remember his name still. I'm like Carl. What happened? He goes that thing. And he just starts talking about how it never works. And I was like, I don't know if that was the way to handle it. Yeah. So like he seemed, it seemed like after a moment he wished he hadn't done that. <laughs> I guess, yeah. like, like in a comforting way, I went over to kind of like clean it up with him, and I picked out off the ground this Dolby noise reduction board that came like flying out of it, and I said, "Can I have this?" And he goes, "Why?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna get this tattooed on my shoulder," <laughs> and I and I took that circuit board to a tattoo artist, and I was like, "Hey." tattooed that on my shoulder and then burn the skin around it like it's underneath my skin like like a terminator kind of feeling mm, you know what i mean mm-hmm. so um uh, the part i never really gave any consideration to is it's on the, my shoulder and i can't see it so yeah, uh, once in a while you'll be drying yourself off i don't know i have to say yo it's me i'm drying myself off and i look in the mirror wrong and it shocks me like yeah, i feel like there's forget something about it oh my God, I feel like there's something on me and I almost swat at it. Like, what the hell? And then your brain goes, that's a tattoo you got when you were 20. And I'm like, oh yeah, never mind." <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's that's all my tattoos. <laughs> well, you know. And I do have a tribal ring funny. of Calvin and Hobbes around my right calf. <laughs> do you know Calvin and Hobbes? I do. All right. I, do. I have Spaceman uh, Spiff. Okay. I have Calvin and Hobbes in the time machine. I have the superhero. What was it? The Scarlet something. I have it when he was doing his homework and he would just, and he would think of himself as a giant walking through the city. Mm-hmm. And I have the um, cover of like probably the most famous book where they're sitting next to each other. I think it's Revenge of the Babysat. And, um, and I got one on the side of my calf 
and then one day realized it didn't look like it was connected to anything. It felt like it was floating <laughs> on my leg. I don't know another way to put that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went back to the guy and I was like, here, I'm going to give you like three more images, like do one on each like hemisphere of my calf and like tie it together. Mm. So anyway, that was a long yeah. time ago. I don't have the money or the time or the patience to get a tattoo anymore. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> or to get them lasered off. But, yeah. Well, listen, these are pretty hideable. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but anyway. All right, man. You were terrific. Yeah. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, of course. Thank you. It, was my, it really was a pleasure to talk to you. Hold on one second for me. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Having an easy to use and accurate blood glucose meter is just one click away. Contour next dot com slash juice box. That's right. Today's episode is sponsored by the Contour Next Gen Blood Glucose Meter. I'd like to thank Cozy Earth for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast and remind you that using my offer code JUICEBOX at checkout will save you 40% off of your entire order at CozyEarth.com. That's the sheets, the towels, the clothing, anything available on the website. Lots of people with autoimmune seem to have trouble with their thyroid, and that's why I've made the Defining Thyroid series. Juiceboxpodcast.com. Click on Defining Thyroid, the menu, to find out more. If you're not already subscribed or following in your favorite audio app, please take the time now to do that. It really helps the show. And get those automatic downloads set up so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording. WrongWayRecording.com.